Uh, good evening. We're going to talk about negationism in India. I wrote about this uh, subject 20 years ago in a book called Negationism in India. Um, after discovering the problems that Islam had created, I have then uh, researched the fundamental doctrines of Islam to understand what motivated this behavior. And now I'm mainly researching other subjects because Islam has practically lost its intellectual interest for me simply because it is a very simple and straightforward topic about which really everything important has been said. Now, of course, it is a matter of implementing the uh, practical conclusions in policies. But you see that I leave to others. Uh, the matter of Islam is very simple. And in India, it has taken the form of a record of destruction. Now, I call this negationism because I call the denial of this fact negationism because it um, constitutes a uh, movement of the denial of a historical fact similar to the denial of the historical facts of the Holocaust in Europe. Uh, in Europe, at least on the continent, we call this negationism. Uh, in English, uh, the term is not very uh, common, so let's say that I introduce the term. But uh, in France, for instance, it is very, very common. Um, the phenomenon of negationism is uh, absolutely a fringe phenomenon. There are some scholars really on the side um, who take the trouble of denying the Holocaust or aspects of the Holocaust, that is to say, the massacre of the Jews, the systematic massacre of the Jews by the National Socialist regime in 1941 to 1945, that is to say, during part of the Second World War. Uh, these people um, are very much shunned, have always been shunned. Um, in a few countries, they are also punishable by law. And uh, because I have written against negationism, many people also in India think that the implication of my criticism of negationism is that I too want negationism banned, that I want laws against the denial of history. That is not true. As far as I'm concerned, anyone can say anything. Um, people can deny the truth as much as they want. Concerning India, they can perfectly deny that Islam played a destructive role. I don't care. Uh, because um, untruths, when uttered in public, can always be refuted. And so, of course, we have to do the job, discharge this duty of actually refuting them but at least it can be done. And so I don't think the law has to do it. You know, if you have to hide behind the law, you will become weak. And so the fact that there are laws against Holocaust denial is invoked by the Holocaust deniers themselves to so-called prove that the case for the Holocaust is weak, is vulnerable, and therefore has to hide behind the law. So the law is having a perverse effect. And I am not at all pleading for such a law of, of censorship. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, the Indian form of negationism uh, is uh, perfectly lawful, only it is wrong. Um, many of the negationists in the West, well, many, there aren't that many, and they are dying out. You see, in the 1990s, it was still a sizable movement. Um, many of the principal names have simply physically died. Some others also have changed their minds, like uh, David Irving, for example, the perhaps only name somewhat known to some Indians is a British historian, not even a diploma historian, but judging by the work he has done, I think he deserves to be called a historian. Um, who uh, went along with the negationists for some time. But you see right now he has turned back somewhat 
um, from that position and is partly now agreeing that the Holocaust happened. Um, and others like Christian Lindner, uh, who is by profession, in fact, a Sanskritist, a colleague, um, nevertheless uh, had in the beginning written about the Holocaust to deny it and is now on the contrary saying that it very much happened and explaining also why it happened. Um, so this is now practically a historical reference, uh, negationism in the West. In India, by contrast, the situation is completely different. Negationists are not a few fringe intellectuals. Uh, they are the government. And everybody who wants to be in the good books of the powers that be. Indeed, you see, it is a very, very wise career move in India to be on the side of the negationists and to talk uh, negationism. In India, the principal problem is the flat-out denial that Islam uh, played a destructive role, a destructive role that started almost immediately after the death of the Prophet, when the first Islamic army tried to reach India by sea, but was repelled. Then uh, several armies were sent from the Caliphate towards India overland, uh, but each of them got defeated. And so the Caliph in uh, Damascus uh, suspended these expeditions for a while because he thought that too many Muslim soldiers got killed in the process. But then ultimately Mohammed bin Qasim in 712 um, endeavored to conquer a part of India of present-day Sindh. And immediately it started uh, with the great massacre of Hindus and a great destruction of Hindu temples. This was in wartime circumstances. You see, after he established his power, things went back to relatively normal, but under Muslim domination, uh, it was very difficult in many places, impossible to rebuild Hindu temples or to utter Hinduism in public. The um, next name, because we have to, uh, of course, skip over a number of events, but the next important name that most of you would know is uh, Mahmoud Ghaznavi, who um, made a number of expeditions into India around the year 1000, and who um, massacred many Hindus, and who uh, destroyed many important temples, including the Somnath Temple in Gujarat. For the first time, eight times later, it was again rebuilt and destroyed again, rebuilt and destroyed again. He also uh, destroyed the um, Krishna Janmabhumi temple complex in Mathura. And I cite this event because it also provides the first major case of negationism, one that set the precedent for the whole movement. In his um, book on the history of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, wrote about Mahmoud Ghaznavi and hinting at the events in Mathura. He wrote that architecture interested Mahmoud Ghaznavi. Well, this is true. Uh, before the destruction of the temple complex in Mathura, Mahmoud Ghaznavi held a speech in which he praised to the sky the temples he saw before him. He said, you see, this is a very beautiful temple complex and the angels could not have built it in a thousand years. These walls are as firm as the faith of the faithful. But you see, after praising this uh, architecture, he then gave orders to destroy everything. And that, of course, Nehru doesn't say. Now, of course, he suspects many of his readers to know the facts. 
So he adds something else that, you see, if they at all raise the objection that Mahmoud Ghaznavi destroyed the Hindu temple complex, then you see he has an answer ready. He says that uh, Mahmoud Ghaznavi was a Mohammedan, that's how he writes it, yeah, was a Muslim, but that was just by the way. He was a soldier and a brilliant soldier. So what he's saying is, okay, if you insist, yeah, maybe he destroyed a few temples, but that was not because he was a Muslim, that was because he had a military temperament, he did things violently. So there you have two forms of negationism, simply flat out denying that events happened, and secondly, okay, admitting that the events happened, but blaming them on something else than on Islam. Now, Islam has a whole theology of temple destruction. Uh, it very much classifies the infidels, the non-Muslims, as enemies. And of course, these enemies in peacetime, if they submit, if they pay the jizya, the so-called toleration tax, if they satisfy a number of uh, conditions, they may be tolerated in a subordinate position. But you see on occasion, um, when uh, some conflict arises, they are to be treated as enemies. So this theology of destruction has led to the implementation of this theology, namely the effective destruction. Uh, as you know, uh, all the uh, suicide terrorists these days say explicitly in their last will or in the, 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 the farewell videos that they have recorded just before they commit their act, they say explicitly that they do it bef because of Islam. Uh, for example, Mohammed Atta of 9-11 uh, fame said very explicitly that it is Islam that motivated him or uh, Mohammed Bouyeri, who killed the film director Theo van Gogh in Amsterdam in 2004, says explicitly that he did it because of Islam. Now, a number of people in India, they are called secularists, um, following the precedent of Jawaharlal Nehru, deny this. Whatever the Muslims say, we know it all better. No, no, it was not because of Islam that they did it. It was because of poverty or because of anti-colonial feelings. You know, some extraneous reason is invented and Islam is denied as a factor of violence. Another character who is important is the nephew of Mahmoud Ghaznavi. Um, he um, entered India. He managed to get a foothold inside India. And in uh, 1033, he uh, entered into battle against Sukhadeva and, among others, Raja Bhoja. There was a coalition of Hindu Maharajas, and they defeated him. So then, India was free from the Islamic danger for the next 150 years. Perhaps the Hindus of those days thought Islam was a problem of the past because they kind of enjoy uh, smugness and sleepwalking and so on. So they thought that this danger had passed. And so they were quite unprepared when Mohammed Ghori came on the scene. In fact, it was worse than that. One Hindu king, Jaya Chandra, made an alliance with uh, Mohammed Ghori against another Hindu king, Prithviraj Chauhan. So in a way, you see, it is Hindus who brought the Muslim armies into India. And then at first, uh, Mohammed Ghori was defeated, but he came back, and then he defeated uh, Prithviraj, and he had no mercy. And then the great destruction starts. Now, this is 1192. In 1194, the Muslim armies go all through the Ganga Valley, and they destroy, among other things, the um, Buddhist establishments, like the Nalanda University, which burned for weeks. 
Uh, this is probably also when the um, temple on the site of the Ram Janma Bhumi was destroyed. I have my quarrels about it with some other Hindu, well, with Hindu historians, with other historians, um, who say that this temple was destroyed by Babar. You know, this was probably destroyed earlier. Anyway, so then the period of the Delhi Sultanate starts, which is a, a very, very destructive age. But fortunately for the Hindus, there was a lot of infighting between the Muslims, so they could not use all their energies against the infidels. And that is why Hinduism has survived. But it was a very destructive regime, which ended in 1526 with the entry of the Mughal dynasty. Now, that also initially was very anti-Hindu. Uh, of Babar also, many massacres of Hindus are known, heaps of or pyramids of Hindu heads. Uh, but under Akbar, his grandson, at least, a certain compromise with the Hindu population was reached. And so then, um, for about 200 years, the situation was bearable for the Hindus. They even got the right to rebuild their temples. And the Mughal Empire could flourish and become a rich empire, mostly because of this compromise. You see, otherwise, they always, the Muslim regime always had to reckon with Hindu rebellions. It was very unstable, whereas now you got a compromise that could last, that could hold out for 200 years. Then, unfortunately, his great-grandson, Aurangzeb, got religion. He was more Muslim than emperor. The others had been more emperor than Muslim. They wanted to enjoy their empire and put Islam between brackets. But this man took Islam seriously. So he reintroduced this toleration tax. He reintroduced a number of prohibitions on Hinduism. And he gave the orders to destroy all the Hindu temples. And so effectively, thousands of temples were destroyed. Now, that um, sounded the death knell, ultimately, of Muslim power in India. Because by then, Hindus had got their act together. And uh, mainly in the character of Shivaji, they rose and they conquered a sizable Hindu empire. And later also, they, they conquered a large part of the Mughal empire without dismantling the Mughal empire. But they became the effective power in the Mughal empire the Marathas, uh, that is. Um, and then the Sikhs conquered their kingdom, the Jats, and so on. So the, it was a very um, bad time for Muslim power, a time of Muslim retreat. And then you get the first so-called fundamentalists, like Shah Waliullah, who preach a return to true Islam as the key to restoring Muslim political power. Then the British come on the scene, and then the whole picture changes. Until then, Hindus had had from experience a very negative image of Islam and of Muslim power. When the British are in power, this memory uh, recedes um, and the facts gradually are forgotten. And the next stage is that the facts are denied. With the Brahmo Samaj, uh, which is a Hindu reform movement in the 19th century, you get the uh, first uh, ideological concern that um, in keeping with fashions, intellectual fashions existing in Europe at the time, that all religions say the same thing. And so you see a few scholars start scouting the Quran to find verses that sound a little bit Hindu, that could be used, you know, as goody goody points, you know, for some book, you know, showing that all religions ultimately say the same thing. And it would be good in that respect to um, say that either Islam wasn't all that bad, 
or if at all we have to admit that Islam did a few things wrong, that other religions all behave the same way. And this more or less is a line that you hear till today, except in those days it was exceptional, today it is obligatory. So you get um, Jawaharlal Nehru, who introduces this line in a big way. You see, until then in the Congress movement, all kinds of ideas exist. Uh, it is mainly Mahatma Gandhi who tries to reconcile a religious Hinduism, a commitment to Hinduism, with this negationist line of being saying friendly things about Islam. Like he said, Islam is a noble faith. Um, but under Nehru, this really becomes an ideology. Until then, you get some vague ideas, sayings that are also explained by the context in which they are said. You know, there's not yet a very firm conviction. But under Nehru, this becomes an ideology. Nehru very much turns against the majority, which happens to be Hindu. Um, in that respect, he was supported by people who sometimes also were his enemies um, on other fronts, namely the communists. The communists were very strongly against majorities in general and against Hinduism in particular. For example, in the 1940s, they supported the Muslim League in its demand for partition. Of course, after partition, the first people to flee East Bengal, which had become East Pakistan, were the communists, because they were persecuted by the Muslims. Just like in Afghanistan, uh, it is the communists who fought and who were fought by the uh, Mujahideen, the Islamic forces. Just like in Iran, the communists joined hands with the Islamists to oust the Shah, but later they themselves were massacred by the Islamists. So it is a very un uneven and unequal and unstable alliance. Nevertheless, it is an alliance that materializes at some points. So the communists frequently support the Muslim cause. And in India, the um, Hindus act as a buffer between the dangers that Islam poses and communist ideology. So there they can keep on being friends with the Muslims, making common cause with the Muslims, because they are not dealing with an Islamic regime. As soon as they have their way and Muslims come to power, then of course they would have to be the first to flee. But you see, that is some way off, so they can go on supporting Islamic causes. And in this case, of course, they are the greatest promoters of negationism. In the 1960s, there was a political intrigue inside the Congress party where Indira Gandhi sought to come to power. Now, she was supported against the other faction in Congress by the communists. And so, as part of the deal between her and the communists, she left to the communists the policy making concerning culture and education. Uh, especially her son Sanjay Gandhi uh, worked out this whole policy and like a typical politician you know what interested him was political power and the cultural educational aspects you know that was a bargaining chip so to the Marxists who were interested in these fields he gave the control of these fields and got as much political power for his family and for, for his faction in the Congress party, which indeed won the power struggle, but had given away uh, the cultural field to the Marxists. And so, headed by Marxists like uh, P.N. Haksar and Nurul Hassan, uh, negationism really became dominant and started controlling all the uh, history books. And so what you find in history books still today is crass negationism. For example, on the Ayodhya issue, uh, the textbooks nowadays 
say that, um, okay, yes, maybe, maybe Muslim armies here or there destroy the temple or two, not too many, but yes, if, if you can point out one, okay, we will not deny it. But, it says, all religions did that. And then it finds a case where um, uh, some Hindu king, nondescript, um, has or is said to have um, destroyed another temple. Or at least, not even that, to have stolen the idol from another temple. And so they equate that with the Islamic campaign of temple destruction, which they minimized. So the uniqueness of the Islamic attitude towards the infidels and their religion is downplayed grossly and systematically. The BJP tried to bring glasnost, you know, openness, reform uh, to this situation in 2002 when the BJP was in government. But what followed was unfortunately a horror show of incompetence where the BJP tried to uh, rewrite the textbooks and did a very inconsistent, uh, very bad job. And so once the Congress came back to power, it had no problem at all justifying a return to the old textbooks or a rewriting of the old textbooks, which, of course, again, would follow the negationist line. So negationism is with us. It's all over the place. Um, what to do about it? Uh, people will say that if we tell the truth, we would only provoke Hindu-Muslim enmity and we would, while describing the conflicts from the past, provoke conflicts in the present. In fact, that has always been a major reason for history denial. You know, it has always been said by Nehru and others that um, the um, history of enmity between the Hindus and Muslims should be downplayed precisely in order to get better relations between Hindus and Muslims. You see, at the time of the freedom movement, some people, not all, but some people, especially Mahatma Gandhi, thought that for the freedom movement to succeed, it should bring in the Muslims because it identi the, the Congress movement was rightly identified by the Muslims as essentially a Hindu movement. So he wanted to bring in the Muslims. That's, for instance, why he supported the Caliphate, the Caliphate movement in 1920 for a restoration of the um, Muslim political power in, in the Middle East. Uh, which, of course, did not succeed and which did not bring the Muslims in. Um, but at any rate, that idea existed. And that has gained ground and then Nehru and others took it over. So in order to appease and to placate the Muslims, that history of Hindu-Muslim conflict and of Muslim destruction had to be downplayed or denied. Now, is this the case? You see, nobody says, well, if you write the history about the Nazi atrocities, that will uh, create, that will provoke violence against Germany. I've never heard that. And any other uh, historical conflict you could name, you know, if you truthfully write the very murderous record of Genghis Khan, nobody says, oh, stop, 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 you shouldn't write this because now people are going to invade Mongolia. So I, I think this is a totally misconceived fear. Uh, the ones who might provoke vi violence are maybe the Muslims. You see, maybe people who say this, people who defend negationism, are secretly Islamophobes 
are secretly thinking that Muslims are violent people. So Islamophiles are secretly Islamophobes, if you get my meaning. Um, moreover, today there is quite a bit of Muslim violence in the news. You see there are all these bomb attacks lately in Volgograd in Russia. But India, of course, has its fair share. I just come from Delhi. I find it a you know, nuisance that all the metro stations have a security apparatus. That you have to go through security in order to go into the metro. You see, even in London, where effectively attacks on the metro have taken place, there are still no security in the metro. You can just walk in and out. Now, in Delhi, this is there because it is needed, because there are so many bomb attacks in India. So bomb attacks make the news. And of course, later, secularist commentators hurry to say, oh, no, 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 this has nothing to do with Islam. But meanwhile, of course, the public has heard about Islamic bomb attacks, knows that the perpetrators were Muslims and so on, and draw their own conclusions. So Islam, Islamic violence is in the news very regularly. And yet, those who take these facts seriously, and those who therefore start to study Islamic doctrine, and start identifying in Islamic doctrine certain teachings that have led to this destructive behavior, those people have never heard a hair on the head of any Muslim. I have never murdered a Muslim. By contrast, you see, quite a few Muslims have been killed. This is true. Quite a few Muslims have been killed in recent years. In Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, Somalia. And by the hands of Westerners. So to, to a Muslim who just vaguely looks at these facts, it looks like the medieval crusades, a Western power intruding into the Muslim world and killing people. But in fact, it's something totally different. You see, the crusaders were anti-Muslim, very openly. They had a religious motive, and they were against Islam as a religion. By contrast, the people who have ordered the bombing of uh, Muslim cities, of Baghdad and so on, they do not have an anti-Islamic motive. Presidents Clinton, uh, Bush, Obama, uh, Prime Minister Blair, David Cameron, uh, the French President uh, Hollande, um, not, yeah, Hollande too, but uh, his predecessor, um, Sarkozy. Uh, all of them have praised Islam to the skies. Even George Bush, the president during 9-11 has refrained from criticizing Islam and has told Muslims that their religion had nothing to do with it. So all these men who praise Islam, I don't praise Islam, but they praise Islam, well, they have killed hundreds of thousands of Muslims. American bombs have rained on Afghan wedding parties killing civilians, killing the bride. So this has really happened, but it has happened by the hands not of people who criticize Islam, but precisely by people who praise Islam. So watch out with people who praise Islam. They might actually kill Muslims. So what should we do ultimately um, in uh, approaching really existing Muslims. Because, of course, many people will say, oh, but my neighbor, you know, he's a Muslim and he's a nice fellow. Now, this is true. Very many Muslims are just perfectly normal human beings. You don't have to suspect a terrorist behind every Muslim. Why is that? Well, Islam is a superficial layer. You see, nobody is born as a Muslim. Islam is an outer layer 
that has been added onto human beings by conditioning, by indoctrination, subsequent to their birth, years after their birth. And so, in fact, Islam is something that can be washed off. There is nothing about Muslims that cannot be washed off, at least not their religion. So that's one thing you should remember, that you are dealing with just a human being like yourself and his religious conditioning. Well, yeah, that is there, but that is not the essence of this fellow human being. That's just a superficial layer. Secondly, most people have some kind of religious instinct. And when they are born in a certain culture, some religion is fed to them. In their case, it is Islam. And they don't think much about it. In fact, they don't know much about it. You see, they go to prayer meetings every once in a while, and they have a religious wedding and a religious burial, and that's about it. Uh, until recently, in fact, many, many Muslims were illiterate, didn't know the Quran, didn't know Islamic teachings, had only a few vague notions about it. So that universal religious instinct is common to everyone. And so that is not a problem either. But you have uh, the ideologized elements who are really imbued with Islam, and there it becomes dangerous. Because it is Islam itself that teaches these things. You see, to say that, um, okay, he did it, but it is not because Islam, because of Islam, really implies that an Islamic court applying Islamic law would condemn these people. Now, that hasn't happened, and I don't think it can happen. You see, if Osama bin Laden had been brought before an Islamic court, he would immediately start invoking the precedent of the Prophet. You see, the Prophet waged jihad. The Prophet kept slaves, sold slaves. The Prophet took prisoners, sold them for ransom. Uh, the Prophet imposed uh, humiliating laws on non-Muslims before altogether expelling them. The Prophet forced uh, pagans to destroy their idols. He gave them the choice between conversion or death. The Prophet actually killed a number of his critics. So the Salman Rushdie affair or any other threat against critics of Islam or the Theo van Gogh affair in Amsterdam uh, is not a new thing. It's not an Islamic. On the contrary, it is an application of the precedent set by the Prophet himself. So to say that the terrorists are not really Muslims amounts to saying, ah, but the Prophet was not really a Muslim. The Prophet was wrong. You know, show me a Muhammad Atta or a Muhammad Buyeri or some other Muslim who says this. The Prophet was wrong. So I, I do think, I personally think that the Prophet was wrong. But then, I'm not one of them. So if you really take Islamic doctrine seri seriously, then a problem starts. And maybe you see if you are temperamentally inclined to put theory into practice, then some acts might follow. So I think that criticism of Islam is very important. Uh, fortunately, now we have all the means to do so. You see, every uh, secluded harem in Saudi Arabia nowadays have, has an internet connection. So, you know, if you throw onto YouTube or some other uh, internet forum uh, the facts about Islam, ultimately they will reach the Muslim population. So they will think twice. And on the other hand, they are also exposed to what the world has to offer. You see, until recently, the hold of Islam over the Muslim populations was mainly a matter of ignorance. People didn't know anything about the outside world. 
whereas now they can learn about the West, about consumerism and so on, but more importantly they can learn about Eastern spirituality, they can learn about anything the world has to offer, I don't need to specify, but at any rate they can learn about the non-Islamic world, and this has its attractions. So I am fairly optimistic that Islam itself uh, will come under scrutiny. And while the secularists here in India keep on defending Islam, keep on shielding Islam from criticism, elsewhere a more realistic approach will be taken. And ultimately it may well be the present Islamic world itself that will teach Indian secularists a better way. Are there any questions? One uh, reason why negationism in India is so successful is because here and there the Hindu masses themselves practice negationism. You see, instead of blaming the Muslims for something that the Muslims have actually done, they blame third parties. For example, in the case of the partition of India, which may or may not have been a good thing. That's another point. But at any rate, the many Hindus resent the partition of India. And so they explain that the partition of India was really the handiwork of the British. Like recently I read a book that you see judging by its agenda would probably be called Hindu fundamentalist, Hindu chauvinist, Hindu uh, fascist, I don't know what, because it is about the situation of the Hindus in Bangladesh. The Hindus there are persecuted. The Hindus there suffer, are constantly subjected to petty terror. Now the book is called Empire's Last Casualty. So it really blames the British for partition, for Pakistan, for the secession from Pakistan of Bangladesh and then from the for the situation of the Hindus inside Bangladesh. Now, I mean, I think this is nonsense. There is no one in Britain then or now who is interested in persecuting the Hindus of, of East Bengal. This is solely the doing of Islam. I mean, in actual practice, it is being done by the Muslim government and the Muslim uh, masses, or at least Muslim agitators of Bangladesh, and also ideologically it is traceable to Islam, it is no, no way traceable to English colonial policies. In the case of Partition II, there is a record of British administrators, the Viceroy and others, trying to dissuade Muhammad Ali Jinnah from his partition plan. You see Viceroys Wavell and Lilith Gao in the 1940s uh, were against partition, said to Jinnah to his face, you see, we built this nice big empire. Even when we have, to, we have to leave it, we are in no mind to destroy it, to split it up. You see, it is only in 1947 when Viceroy Mountbatten came and when the world situation had changed because of the beginning Cold War, that the British saw, well, we see, maybe it has its advantages. Because then when there are two countries, at least one of them will side with us, while the others will side with the Soviets. Um, but mainly, the main factor was that there was an increasing threat of violence from the Muslims. And so the British thought, you see, this is going to end in bloodshed. It is better to give in to the Muslim League, to concede to them their Pakistan. But you see, by then it was spring 1947, and even Congress leaders like Nehru, like Rajaji, and so on, were coming around to the partition plan. And then in June 1947, even Mahatma Gandhi. So what the British did was no different from what Indians did. So there was no British conspiracy to force the partition on India. You see, that is a myth believed by Indians. And before Indian audiences, whether communist or Congress or Hindu nationalist, you can always get applause by accusing the British of causing partition. 
Well, this is not true. This is simply not true. And it is a case of negationism that goes down very well. So you see with negationism, we have a problem that has its roots in a part of the population in some particular situations that is very much and very deliberately aggravated by a certain political class, but that we can do something about, namely to tell the truth. Well, you have the outright uh, denial. Uh, no, before that, before you have denial, you have uh, another safer technique, which is simply to kill by silence. You just don't mention certain facts. Uh, for example, in the Battle of Talikota, which ended the Vijayanagar Empire, 1565, uh, the Vijayanagar Empire had a very multicultural, or as you call it, secular army with two divisions of Muslims fighting against a coalition of Muslims on the other side. Now, when the battle went in, the, into, in, in favor of the Vijayanagar army, these two um, Muslim commanders remembered their religion. So you see, they were playing the secular game up to a point. But when it got really serious, they defected, they went over to the other side, and the Muslim coalition won and destroyed Vijayanagar. So, you see, in, in very many textbooks, this is never mentioned. In a few, this is, of course, explained away. You see, that is then another technique. So you have silence, as most common. You know, just pay as little attention as possible to this record. And that's what the secularists do all the time. And in fact, um, the whole amusement industry and so on is geared to that. You know, keep Hindus busy with other issues, you know, so that they don't study this. Then you have outright denial. Then you have um, minimization. Uh, a, a classic case, for instance, is uh, uh, Richard Eaton, an American Islamologist, who calls himself a Marxist. It's not me, you know, inventing this. He himself says so. And so he defends Islam, and he tries to minimize the number of temples that Muslim rulers have destroyed. Um, so, you know, he says it's a small number, which the secularists, uh, secular journalists, commentators, translate as 80 temples. So this, this is a number bandied about. I've seen it regularly. Uh, you know, in, in all of Muslim history in India, 80 Hindu temples were destroyed. Now, even this is not what Eton says. Eton lists 80 cases, but you should study these 80 cases. For instance, he says that um, uh, one case is that the troops of uh, Mohammed Ghori or his successor, uh, Aibak, Kutubuddin Aibak, destroyed a thousand temples in Varanasi. So one may really mean a thousand. Um, so it's quite a few, but at least, you see, it is considerably less than what really happened. You see, they bandy about some figure that minimizes the real figure. And then what can also be done is to whitewash. You see, to say, okay, the facts happened, but uh, they happened for a good reason like you see the communists used to do about Stalin. Okay, Stalin massacred many people, but the class enemies had to be destroyed. You know, maybe if he had had water cannon instead of bullets, you know, he could have done it another way, but he had to murder them, unfortunately. Um, so this is, this is applied here also. Um, you know, because Brahmin conspiracy, for instance. Uh, like they say, for example, uh, Aurangzeb destroyed all the temples in Varanasi because there was a Brahmin conspiracy. You see, one of the Mughal princesses had been abducted by Brahmins and was hidden away in a temple, and so that's why the temples had to be destroyed. 
you know, that's a good story. In fact, I've analyzed and found the, true, the truth about that story. Um, but it was, it was said by uh, Sita Ramaya, a, uh, an assistant of Mahatma Gandhi, a politician favored also by Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, you know, I mean, it may have been said in good faith. You see, some, some mullah or something said that to him, uh, you know, over a cup of tea sometime, not really very seriously. And he believed it, he lapped it up. And then in some other discussion where he could use this example, he brought this up, and probably in good faith. You see, because of course, you know, Hindus have a way of, of inventing conspiracies, of seeing conspiracies everywhere. Now, in the case of negationism, you see a few of the early communists, Jawaharlal Nehru and so on, knew what they were doing and were deliberately lying. But you see, after that, you see, many people have lapped up these lies and didn't know better. There was also nobody else to speak against those lies. And so they started interiorizing this view of history and in good faith repeating this story. You know, that is very common. And I, I see it a lot in the youth nowadays that has brought, been brought up on these, uh, you know, Marxist-designed textbooks. And so they don't know any better than that, um, you know, uh, uh, Akbar had a love affair with a Rajput princess and so on. I mean, that it was all hunky-dory. Um, so they don't know any better. In that, in that sense, you see, real historians still have a long way to go to counter negationism. So let's do that. Well, it is true that when I wrote that book uh, 20 years ago, Negationism in India, it was still from a position of moral superiority. You know, I really was convinced this cannot happen in Europe. You know, this is a typically Indian problem. And in Europe, you see scholarly, respect for scholarly findings has advanced to this extent that a denial of history is impossible. Well, unfortunately, I was too optimistic. You see, after 9-11, you have on the one hand a movement of very strong Islam criticism, where, you know, Westerners, I dare say, have gotten into the act far more thoroughly than Hindus have done, even though Hindus have had more reason for it. Uh, but on the other hand, you have the opposite movement, and which is more powerful. You have many uh, government people and then you have the dominant voices in the media that deny all this criticism and that defend Islam and that try to blur the issue and that take all the, the same superficial attitude that characterizes secularism in India, namely to, uh, you know, to paper over uh, everything that Islam has done, to paper over Islamic doctrine, to dismiss Islamic doctrine as not important as immaterial to, you know, the terrorism that really happens. So we, we do now have the same problem of negationism in the West. I agree. And there too we have to fight it. Thank you.